Welcome. Um, again, my name is Ashley Klein Jimenez. I'm with Prevent Connect, and you're joining us for our web conference today titled Prevalence of Workplace Related Sexual Violence Moving from Context to Creating Protective Environments for Prevention. Prevent Connect is a national project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, sponsored by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided on this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the U.S. government, CDC, or CalCASA. So today, we're going to be hearing from um, our CDC partners on a study that was recently published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine um, that examined the prevalence of several different types of sexual violence um, by a workplace-related perpetrator. And then we're also going to be hearing from partners at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center on what this data really means for preventing sexual violence in the workplace, um, what's already happening, what are some resources for us to be able to advance that work. And I want to say, so these are our objectives, <laughs> um, but I want to say that obviously workplace sexual violence is not like a new thing that's happening, um, but it has become part of the public dialogue more so in the past couple of years. Um, and so I'm sharing with you all a screenshot from a 2013 uh, PBS documentary titled Rape in the Fields, um, and then also a 2015 documentary that also aired on PBS titled Rape on the Night Shift. Um, and so these documentaries, you know, they're a couple years old. I think Rape on the Night Shift was um, updated in 2018. But these documentaries really told the stories of immigrant women, and specifically farm worker and janitorial workers, um, who had experienced multiple forms of sexual violence while at work. And not only did, did these documentaries really highlight their stories, um, but it also kind of explored the ways in which the actual work environment um, created vulnerability for the, um, for the women workers. So those are some examples of um, things in the past couple of years that have really kind of started to explore um, workplace sexual violence. But then also the Me Too and Time's Up movements um, kind of illuminated the realities of sexual violence in the workplace across sectors. So um, what you see on your screen right now are just screenshots of articles that um, have been published just in January of 2020 around workplace sexual violence. Um, and so we know that this is a really big conversation. It's something that um, affects a lot of people. And um, so that's why I'm so excited to be able to have this conversation today with our guests. Um, and so Kathleen Bastille, um, Kathleen is at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Division of Violence Prevention. And Kathleen, we're always so happy to have you on Prevent Connect web conferences um, to share research and data um, and, and kind of help us make sense out of what you're finding. So thank you so much for being here. And then Jennifer Grove, the Prevention Director at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, also always happy to have Jen on Prevent Connect web conferences to really start to think about, like, what is this research, what is this data telling us, um, and how does it apply to our prevention work and efforts? So with that, Kathleen, I'm officially introducing you now. <laughs> so Kathleen, how are you today? I am great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're really, really happy that you're here, um, and we are going to make you a presenter. Um, and Kathleen, I think that the first thing we actually wanted to do before I really hand this show over to you is we wanted to get a sense um, from our audience if folks are familiar with um, the article that you're going to be sharing today. Um, so I just put it on the screen asking folks how familiar are you with the national prevalence sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator. And Kathleen, I'm broadcasting the results, so you should be um, able to see how folks are voting. And so you'll see that the majority of people 
So web conference announcement was really the first time that they learned of the um, report, but there are, you know, quite a, a handful of people who have at least skimmed it. So I wanted to share that with you. And it's actually great that the majority of you haven't read it because, Kathleen, you're going to go through and, and share some of the findings. So I'm going to take that away, and I'm going to pass this over to you. Kathleen, will you tell us about um, the national prevalence of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator? Great. I'm happy to, and I'm, I'm happy that not many people have read it because they'll be pretty bored if they have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to move on and to the next slide, and I, I, I want to start by acknowledging my co-authors uh, for this research paper, Ashley D'Anverno and Jing Wang. And this slide is just giving you a sense of what, uh, just an overview here of what I will discuss today on the call. Um, I'll start with some brief words about the public health issue of sexual violence, what we know about sexual violence in the workplace, and where the gaps, where we saw the gaps were. Um, and then I'll go through the research findings from the recent study that Ashley um, uh, pointed out, and then discuss the findings, discuss uh, limitations of the findings, and implications for prevention. And I think here and there throughout we'll have time for questions. Okay, so let me start with some background um, information. So recent public allegations of sexual misconduct in the workplace started in Hollywood, as, as many of you probably know, but quickly reverberated across industries. So it was in fall 2017, the Me Too movement reemerged. It, it, it had existed before, but it reemerged in 2017 in the fall out of the high-profile celebrity cases in the news becoming a national conversation and a viral hashtag, the Me Too movement. So bringing sexual violence and its impacts to the forefront uh, has helped to destigmatize victimization and encourage systematic change um, reflected by the MeTooMovement.org, um, particularly in the workplace. The Me Too movement has also generated recent attention in the research community for the renewed focus on workplace sexual harassment as a public health issue. So, but as we know, and as Ashley pointed out a few minutes ago, sexual violence in the workplace is not new. It has plagued workers for centuries. Um, it was not until the widely cited book, Sexual Harassment of Working Women, was published in the year 1979 that workplace sexual harassment became recognized in the courts as a form of sex discrimination. Um, and then a recent study, a recent panel survey in 2018, uh, found that 38% of women and 13% of men experienced workplace sexual harassment in their lifetime. So much has been learned about this topic, but there, there still are major gaps in our understanding of workplace sexual harassment. So what are the characteristics of workplace-related sexual harassment that we know from the literature? Well, uh, previous research has described adolescent victims of workplace sexual harassment, and there um, are studies on male victims of workplace sexual harassment, although there are more female than male victims. Uh, workplace sexual harassment is not just verbal harassment, but there are other uh, types of harassment happening in the workplace or, or sexual violence, including physical and non-physical types of uh, sexual violence, all of which have negative impacts. Um, there are many impacts that have been identified and documented in the literature, both in individual and organizational impacts. Some examples are job satisfaction, organizational commitment, uh, and health, and this includes things like serious injury or anxiety. Um, it has been associated with costs to the organization, including legal fees, high turnover, reduced productivity, uh, negative publicity, and increased absenteeism. So it, um, other points to make out here, it's important for prevention to understand the sex and type of perpetrators and differences uh, by male and female victims. So what we know from previous research is that female victims report mostly male perpetrators. Male victims report both male and female perpetrators. And findings from a recent study, the 2018 study, found that women were more likely than men. Women were 25% and men were 10% uh, to report a boss or supervisor. And about 30% of both sexes, both 
males and females reported a coworker as a perpetrator of workplace harassment or workplace uh, related violence. So what are the gaps? So this study that I'm about to present on uh, fills gaps in the literature in a few ways. So we use a large nationally representative telephone survey sample of the United States, U.S. adults, um, and we examine prevalence for women and men of five forms of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator, including two types of perpetrators, authority figures and non-authority figures, and I'll, I'll give more detail on that in a minute. And this will provide more detail on the types of perpetrators than what we've seen in previous studies. Uh, we also report the proportion of female and male victims by the sex and type of perpetrator and the proportion of victims who experience impacts resulting from workplace-related sexual violence. So we think this allows an increased understanding of, of the sex of perpetrators of male victims, as well as some unique impacts associated with workplace-related sexual violence by authority and non-authority figures. So those are some of the gaps that we're trying to fill. And let me um, tell you a little bit about our, our data source. We use data from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey for this study that we fondly refer to as NISFIS. NISFIS was funded uh, and launched by CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, where I work, in 2010. And that first year, we had support from NIJ and DOD. So NISFIS is an ongoing nationally representative random digit dial telephone survey that assesses experience of sexual violence, stalking, and intimate partner violence among adult women and men in the United States, and it provides both national and state-level data. I'm going to be talking about national data today. For this research, we use the combined data years of 2010, 2011, and 2012. Data were collected in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Interviews were conducted between January of 2010 and December of 2012, with a total of just over 41,000 completed interviews. Um, that breaks out to 22,590 uh, interviews from women and 18,584 interviews from men, just in case you were curious. Uh, NISPIS uses a dual-frame sampling strategy that includes both landline and cell phones. Um, and 43.3% and of the interviews were conducted by landline, and about 56 or 57% were conducted by cell phone for these years. Um, and, and I just want to point out that we use average annual estimates to determine prevalence. So that means we average across the three years of data. Okay. I'm almost to the findings. I just want to tell you a little bit about the measures. In this, this uh, sexual violence is defined and measured as, uh, as you see here, completed or attempted penetration through force or alcohol drug facilitation. That's what we typically refer to as rape, uh, being made to sexually penetrate someone. That's both completed or attempted through force or alcohol drug facilitation. That's what we usually refer to as being made to penetrate. Um, Non-physically forced pressured sex, what we typically call sexual coercion. An unwanted sexual contact that could be groping or touching in a sexual way, touching in any way, um, and non-contact unwanted sexual experience that could be sexual remarks, some kind of verbal harassment, etc. So for this study, I just want to point out, as you'll see in a few minutes, given the low disclosure of rape um, from men and being made to penetrate uh, from women we report rape victimization only for women, and we report being made to penetrate only for men. So I just want to bring that to your attention before we move forward. Okay, and, and I mentioned earlier that um, we, we cover or we capture authority figures and non-authority figures in this study. So in this, the respondent is asked about the perpetrator of different types of violence victimization, whatever they report that are covered in the study. And um, in this, there are two categories of workplace-related perpetrators that we capture. So uh, authority figures include bosses, supervisors, or superiors in command, what we're calling in this study authority figures, and what we call non-authority figures are coworkers, customers, or clients. So I want to make uh, this point that I'll reiterate later. 
um, that in, in this research we're referring, as you see, to workplace-related perpetrators. The reason why is because we cannot determine from the data if the sexual violence actually occurred in the workplace, but we do know that it was perpetrated by someone known from the workplace, either authority figure or, or a non-authority figure. So that's why you see the, the phrase workplace related. Kathleen, this is Ashley. Yeah. So, um, so, it's, so it was looking at um, workplace related sexual violence by a perpetrator that perhaps worked with individuals, but could also be someone who um, doesn't actually work at a location, but like comes in as a client or um, is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. It's some. Yeah. Thank you for asking that because it's worth clarification. It's somebody related to the workplace. So it's it's in many cases, I'm sure it's somebody they work with, like a boss or a supervisor or a coworker. But we also capture in the NISPIS category customers and clients. So it could be somebody that you know or you've seen because of where you work. So a customer who comes into your workplace or something like that. We don't, and I'll, I'll talk about this earlier, we don't differentiate between those groups. We just have authority figures and non-authority figures. But thank, thank you for asking me. that. Okay. Yeah. Oops. I went forward and I hadn't discussed this one. Okay. So in this analysis, we are, we're examining five impacts from the list of impacts included in NISPIS um, to see their association with this particular type of violence, sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator. So the impacts we include in the study are fear, concern for safety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms like nightmares or something like that, um, injuries or missing at least one day of work or school. Okay. And um, in terms of our procedures for the analysis, prevalence and population estimates were calculated based on weighted analysis, and that takes into account the complex sampling design features, um, stratified sampling, dual sampling frames, unequal sample selection probabilities. Um, a weighted analysis are conducted using SAS Sudan. Um, so here we are reporting in this uh, study the following. We report national lifetime prevalence of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator. We look at that by the sex of the victim and by the type of workplace-related perpetrator, like I said, authority or non-authority figures. Um, we also look at the sex of the perpetrator among victims of this type of violence and the lifetime impacts among victims. Okay. So finally, let's get to some of the findings. This table gives the lifetime prevalence of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator for women. So this is just women in this table in the U.S. So what we see here is 5.6% of women in the U.S., and that's almost 7 million women, reported some type of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator in their lifetime. 3.9% reported sexual violence by a non-authority figure, and 2.1% of women reported it by an authority figure. And this is any time in their lifetime. Uh, unwanted sexual contact was the most commonly reported type of workplace-related sexual violence reported by women. You see there 3.5% of women reported unwanted sexual contact, and that's about 4.2 million U.S. women. Non-contact unwanted sexual experiences perpetrated by a workplace-related perpetrator were reported by 2.4% of U.S. women, and that's broken down 1.8% um, were non-authority figures and 0.7, a little bit less than 1% were authority figures. And finally, 0.8% uh, or about 1 million women are estimated to have been raped and a similar number sexually coerced by a workplace-related perpetrator at some point in their life. Okay, and this table is similar, but it's for male uh, victims. This is U.S. men. Um, approximately, as you see here, 2.5% of U.S. men, and that's an estimated 3 million men, reported lifetime sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator. That breaks out to 2% reporting a non-authority figure and 0.6% reporting sexual violence by an authority figure. Um, unlike women uh, who had unwanted sexual contact as the most common, uh, men are reporting uh, uh, 
uh, non-contact unwanted sexual experiences most often. Um, and that's 1.3% of U.S. men reporting that 1.1% were non-authority figures. So most of them were non-authority figure and 0.3% were authority figures. Unwanted sexual contact was reported by 1.2%. Um, broken down 0.9% for non-authority figure and 0.3% for an authority figure. And more than an estimated 400,000 men, that's about 0.4%, uh, have been sexually coerced in their lifetime by a workplace-related perpetrator. And an estimated 184,000 men have been made to penetrate. So those are the prevalence numbers for men. Now we are moving to the sex of perpetrator and this table uh, provides data for both female and male victims. Now, I want to point out the previous tables were lifetime prevalence among U.S. women and men. This table is just focused on a proportion among victims. So those who, who um, said, yeah, said that they experienced workplace-related perpetrator, we asked them about the sex of the perpetrator. And as you can see in the table, most of the female victims of workplace-related sexual violence reported only male perpetrators, 96.2%. So that's the large majority. For male victims, um, the findings were split between only male perpetrators, that's for about 41%, and only female perpetrators, which are about 54%, 536 this pattern was observed for male victims with authority and non-authority uh, figure perpetrators, as you can see there. Very few female or male victims reported both male and female perpetrators. So it was it was uh, it was either one or the other. In some cases, for men, it was kind of split. And that's as I said earlier, um, it's consistent with the previous literature. What we found there. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a series of bar charts um, to add some color to the slide. Um, this figure presents the impacts reported by female victims. So this is just a, a slide for female victims of workplace-related perpetrators um, and the impact, the five impacts that I mentioned earlier. It's important to note in NISFIS, um, this is uh, something you need to know about NISFIS to understand these data. This has captured the impacts of anything the victim reported by a specific perpetrator. So for these workplace-related perpetrators, victims may be reporting on impacts of other violence by that specific perpetrator. And I'll get back to that um, at the end of the presentation, but I just wanted to let you know that here. For this slide, uh, uh, the blue, the, let me tell you what the colors mean. The blue bars are um, any workplace-related perpetrator. The orange bars are non-authority figures and the green bars are authority figures. As you can see here, the most commonly reported impact among female victims was fear. Almost 30% of female victims, and that's an estimated 2 million victims, reported fear, and the proportion was similar for victims perpetrated by authority or non-authority figures. Um, it's 30.9% for authority and 28.3% for non-authority. Uh, concern for safety and PTSD symptoms were also commonly reported by female victims. Reports of these impacts by female victims was about 23% overall and split relatively uh, evenly across the type of perpetrator. Um, and then missing work or school and injury were less commonly reported. So about 7% of female victims, that's about half a million victims, reported missing school or work and 3.6% reported an injury. Okay, so those are the female data. And now this is a similar slide for male victims. Um, and what we see here is similar to female victims. Male victims uh, reported fear most commonly. 14.3% of male victims reported fear, and 22.6% of male victims reported fear when the perpetrator was an authority figure. And that's 22.6% um, for authority figure and 11.4% for non-authority figure. Um, approximately one-tenth of male victims reported concern for safety um, or PTSD symptoms as impacts. And for PTSD symptoms, 19% reported an authority figure and 6.9% reported a non-authority figure. 
So the proportion of male victims who missed work or school or suffered an injury because of this type of violence were low, and as a result, were not statistically reliable, so we could not report them. Okay, so to su this slide is just summarizing the findings because I know I threw a lot at you. Um, so to summarize, the prevalence of sexual violence by a workplace-related perpetrator is concerning. We found one in 18 women and one in 40 men have experienced this type of violence in their lifetime. Consistent with previous literature, we found that female victims almost always reported a male perpetrator, whereas male victims reported both male and female perpetrators. Um, the most commonly reported forms of, of this type of violence were unwanted sexual contact. Approximately 4 million women and 1.4 million men reported that and non-contact, unwanted sexual experience. That's 2.9 million women and 1.5 million men. Um, but we should not lose sight of the fact that all the types of sexual violence that we captured in NISBIS were reported by a workplace-related perpetrator. That includes rape of women, um, males being made to sexually penetrate someone, and sexual coercion experienced by both uh, females and males. And this form of violence, uh, workplace-related violence, is impactful based on our data. The most commonly reported impact was fear, but concern for safety, PTSD symptoms, and other impacts were also reported. Okay. Let me um, point out a few cautionary notes. Um, one, as I mentioned, this is a random digital phone survey, and they um, may not include certain populations, such as those living in institutions, prisons, nursing homes, homeless shelters, et cetera. Um, and it's becoming more and more challenging uh, to gather survey data by phone uh, through these methods, and so it affects the representativeness of the sample. So the response rates across the three years was roughly 33% but the cooperation rate was high at over 80%. So um, another point to make is that the estimates provided are likely underestimates. Uh, like any study of sexual violence, they're likely underestimates of the true prevalence of sexual violence. There's many reasons for this. A stigma associated with sexual violence um, may have led those not to disclose, particularly if the victimization happened recently. Um, so we focus on lifetime estimates, as I said, so this may not be as much an issue, but it's worth pointing out. Um, but we know that survey estimates are generally underestimates, um, and NISFIS does not capture specific kinds of workplace-related sexual violence, such as quid pro, pro quo harassment, as I mentioned previously. So that's worth pointing out. We, we ask about sexual violence, and then we ask who the perpetrator is, but we don't um, ask specific types of sexual violence that might be um, more relevant to the workplace. Also, this analysis only looked at five negative impacts associated with the violence. These impacts were really the only impacts from, this, from the full list of impacts that we measure in NISFIS that are large enough prevalence to report among this sample. So it's likely there are other impacts of this type of violence, but they're just not um, being measured in NISFIS. For example, getting fired from a job or needing to find a new job, those may be some areas for future uh, research or another, other impacts. Um, also related to impacts, as I began to describe earlier, I want to say a little bit more about it here. Because the survey was designed to capture all the impacts of any violence by a particular perpetrator, it is not known for 100% certain that sexual violence was the violence that led to the negative impacts that we describe in the study. It could have been some other form of violence. But since the only other forms of violence that we measure in this with our intimate partner violence and stalking, we are very confident that the impacts presented in this study are related to sexual violence because the IPV is captured separately in NISFIS, and overwhelmingly the majority of workplace-related perpetrators, 97% for female victims and 98% for male victims, did not perpetrate stalking. So we can confidently say that the impacts we reported here are related to the sexual violence that they reported. Um, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, we do not know if the sexual violence reported occurred in the workplace. It might have occurred outside the particular workplace that they work uh, for or at. Um, what we do know is that they reported a workplace-related perpetrator, like I said. And um, the, the one final thing, we can't disentangle the types 
of uh, authority and non-authority figure combinations that we, we measure in NISVA simply because they're captured as groups. Um, so, for example, there are likely to be important differences between a coworker and a customer, for example, but we, we, they're, in this study, they're both considered non-authority figures, so we can't look more deeply into the differences there. Okay. So hey, with Kathleen? that, yes, please. Quick question. Um, so we had a question in the audience wondering if any of the, the phone calls, the surveys were conducted in um, any languages other than English. Oh, thank you for that question. Yes, and I, I'm sorry I didn't point that out. English and Spanish are the, the languages we conduct the surveys. Great. We have some other questions, but I think we'll um, wait till the end and we'll come back to those. So if you want to okay. talk a little about, about the future research. Okay. I'll, I, I shouldn't be much longer. So future oh, no. research. Plenty of time. Um, <laughs> okay, I want to share some ideas that we've had on future research after doing this study. Um, so first of all, future research examining sexual violence in the workplace by industry seems seems like it would be important. It could be useful for guiding prevention activities. Um, as we know from uh, some of the literature that certain industries may have higher rates of sexual violence than others, so for example, the service industry. So we think looking by industry, we can't do that with NISFIS data, but we think future research should uh, look at industry. Also, um, although both authority figure and non-authority figure perpetrators were examined in this study, so I think it contributed because uh, other studies haven't looked exactly uh, in the way that we did at authority versus non-authority figures. Um, so it does provide more detail, but we think uh, – Future research that looks in more detail, like I was saying, the difference between a boss and a coworker, and specific types of perpetrators in specific industries, that could inform uh, prevention efforts as well. In addition, uh, we think it would be helpful and useful to include better measurement of sexual violence in studies of workplace-related sexual violence. So, like I said, we measure, we have many um, items measuring sexual violence in NISFIS but they're not capturing key tactics used by workplace-related perpetrators. So capturing, uh, you know, like I said, quid pro quo, harassment, a boss offering a promotion in exchange for sexual favors, um, it would be helpful to capture those kind of key tactics that, that we hear about in the workplace for future research to better understand um, how this is happening. And finally, future research uh, we think would be beneficial that considers sexual minority status. As we've seen in prior research, um, their suggestion that they may be at risk for this type of victimization. Um, and Kathleen, yes. so I just wanted to, so um, it's really interesting because, um, so the future research around examining like the specific types of workplace perpetrators, um, we are noticing a couple slides back when you were showing the um, tables that um, for the lifetime impacts among female victims, it looked like um, it was a non-authority perpetrator where there was the highest reported concern for safety. Um, and so that just, you know, was interesting, I think, because if it was someone who maybe doesn't work um, with the individual but is, um, you know, accessing that workplace of, like, a customer or a client or, or a patient, a patient um, is that playing into um, – the concern for safety. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so Valencia had a question, and I, I thought I would ask it here um, before we kind of shift and start talking about some of the implications around prevention. Um, but Valencia said, since the findings indicate, and this goes back to um, where it looked like few people were reporting that they were missing work. Um, Valencia is wondering, is it a logical conclusion that um, folks who have been victimized um, at work are going to work anyways um, for, for concern for, um, sorry, are going to work for in fear or concern of safety? Um, is that a conclusion? That <laughs> um, so it's a good it's a good point. We can't make that conclusion in this study, unfortunately, because we are looking at lifetime reports. So this could have happened mm. 
any time in their lifetime. It's not necessarily currently happening. And if I had to guess, it's probably not currently happening. Um, but it's any time in the lifetime. Um, so, you know, it would be helpful to look at, we just didn't have the, the numbers to look at it, but to look at more recent experiences and to see what's happening and, you know, the impacts. And that would better inform prevention. Um, but we don't know if, if there, you know, if, if a proportion of those who reported in this study are experiencing, uh, current fear, you know, of, of individuals at work or anything like that. Cause we don't know when it happened. We know that it happened some point in their life. Got it. Thank you for that clarity. Okay. Okay. So should I wrap up with the prevention implications or any other questions at this point? There was one, um, there was another conversation that happened um, a little bit earlier and really kind of like pointing to a gap perhaps in um, studies around workplace sexual violence um, and including um, non-binary or gender diverse folks. Um, and so there was some resource sharing in the text chat around, um, you know, some data that would um, speak to um, the, the realities of workplace sexual violence for non-binary or gender diverse, mm -hmm. um, diverse individuals. So I wanted to, to point that out to you. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I've, I've missed a lot of the conversation because I'm, <laughs> I'm focused on my notes here. But yeah, that, you know, no, I, would, I, I would agree that that's, a, that's a, a big gap. There are so many gaps, and I only pointed to a few on my slides. Um, you know, NIFSA can't speak to that, but future research should uh, focus on that in some way. We, we don't have, uh, we don't capture much and we don't have enough of a sample uh, to look across uh, different groups around gender identity, et cetera, at least not yet. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree that that's a gap and there are many gaps um, in this, in this area. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay. Alrighty, so um, let me talk about prevention implications. So um, this is really the so what. So what does does this mean for prevention? Um, so for one, the findings in the study, what we found that all forms of sexual violence, both contact and non-contact forms, are being perpetrated by workplace-related perpetrators, suggests that information-only sexual harassment trainings that focus on things like verbal harassment or a hostile work environment and not, uh, not also including predatory or potentially threatening or physical behavior, um, those types of programs may not be enough to address all the forms of sexual violence that are occurring in the U.S. workplace context. Um, so, and just uh, related to that, previous work has conceptualized workplace sexual harassment, uh, and I thought this was helpful, um, as including three components. The one is patronizing conduct, that's like sexist but non-sexual, uh, taunting conduct, conduct, which is sexual gestures and other behaviors that create a hostile environment, and predatory conduct, that's uh, what involves physical acts. So uh, the point that I'm making here is the data from this study suggests that all three of those components are important to address in workplace sexual violence uh, prevention efforts. Also, uh, previous research has shown that proactive workplace sexual harassment prevention approaches um, are important to those involving a commitment from top management, consistent and regular mandatory training, zero tolerance for uh, sexual harassment, and sharing with applicants and new hires of harassment-free environments. All of these things are important in reducing workplace sexual violence, and this is actually uh, listed in our sexual violence prevention technical package as an evidence-based approach. Um, so it's important to point out that those, uh, those types of programs uh, or approaches work, and there's some evidence there. Um, it's also important for the field to address the original drivers of workplace-related sexual violence that women and men experience. So much of this aggression falls along social status and power lines, um, and it's, prevention is really going to require an examination of these issues, issues of gender inequality in the broader population, and that, that trickle down into work and that drive this form of violence. 
Um, and then finally, the observed sex differences that we were able to, to see in our study by looking at male and female data separately, um, I think those findings should be noted because they may inform prevention efforts because we did find some sex differences in the study. Okay. I think that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, that is all really, really fascinating. There's a lot of good conversation happening in the text chat. When you mentioned um, kind of like the three components or um, I don't know if I should say, like, types of sexual harassment, um, patronizing, taunting, and predatory. Um, people were really interested in, you know, um, those three, just knowing that, you know, there's different forms of sexual harassment and where have prevention um, efforts really focused efforts in and, um, you know, how can we expand to really include all three of those components. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to, I feel like it's a really good segue. We actually wanted to go to our audience now and ask you all, um, because Kathleen did mention, um, you know, proactive workplace sexual harassment um, prevention approaches, and Tori posted a link to the technical package, um, Kathleen, as you mentioned, and I know that Jen is going to um, talk more about the technical package, but we're wondering right now what approaches are folks using to prevent sexual violence, workplace-related sexual violence? Um, and so we're going to post that in the text chat, and we'd love for you all who are joining us today um, to take a minute and let us know what, what are you doing currently to prevent workplace-related sexual violence? Um, and Kathleen, it looks like folks are responding, so it'll be interesting to hear um, the work that's happening currently. Um, but I just wanted to, to thank you again for walking us through um, that data and um, the research. And um, I know that we'll bring you back at the end for more questions. Um, let's see. Um, but let me tell you what was coming up so far. So Valencia says, um, I've been doing safety planning with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, mostly for intimate partner violence that could impact our campus. So it sounds like Valencia is on a, a college, maybe a college campus. Um, Kiana says, I'm running tailored training, building knowledge, um, bystander intervention, and harassment interruption strategies. Um, Tashana says annual trainings and open dialogue. Um, Liat says we have a toolkit that we work through with academic departments on campus that looks at everything from policies to communication, social events, field placement, hiring, and retention, et cetera. Judy says training and sharing resources um, that were mentioned in futures. We'll be showing some of those um, resources in a bit. Um, let's see, Bethany says um, a bystander intervention training that's really targeted at workplace sexual um, violence, um, facilitating more conversations around boundary setting and bystander intervention, um, talking about respecting people, um, personal space maybe. We have trainings on prevention and how it is different than risk reduction. Um, so there's a lot of things. Um, that folks, and thank you so much, continue to, to share what you're currently doing. Um, but Kathleen, those are some of the things that are coming up, so I wanted to share those with you as we transition over to talk with Jen Grove. So with that, I want to introduce you all to our next guest. Um, Jennifer Grove, the Prevention Director at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, or NSVRC. Um, Jen, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate you um, making time out of your day to come. And, and now, after hearing Kathleen's uh, presentation, to talk with us about what does this mean for our prevention work? Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, we're really excited um, to be one of your collaborative partners, and we work very closely with Ashley and David and Tori and their team, as well as Kathleen and um, many folks from CDC through our Rape Prevention Education Grant Project, which funds our National Resource Center. So always excited to be um, able to hop on these webinars, these web conferences, and really um, 
yeah, learn. I'm learning. I learned so much just even through the text chat. Um, I was really deeply involved in that and almost forgot to unmute my phone. So thanks for that, everyone, um, and keep that coming. Yeah, I wanted to just um, just briefly talk about our our work around prevention in this area, um, the resources that are out there, and um, a little bit about what we're hearing when it comes to folks reaching out for resources and technical assistance on this issue. So this slide, I hope these images are familiar to many of you. Um, at least I hope they are. I see who's on the I see who's on this. I see the participant list, and I know there are many of you who this should not be new to. Um, CDC has created this Stop SB Technical Package as a guide for those who are working to prevent sexual violence in their communities. If you look at the chart on the right, this is a table of the strategies and approaches that are highlighted within the package. These strategies and approaches span the various levels of the social ecology, as you probably can see. You might, you might be able to see it. It's a little small on my screen. Um, promoting healthy social norms and teaching skills are ways that we can reach people at the individual and relationship level, and I think a lot of that has happened and continues to happen. And we also know um, that SV part at the bottom, we know that supporting survivors is very important to both addressing and preventing sexual violence in a really comprehensive way. Um, but what we do know, um, and I want to focus in on the O and the P of the STOP SB, um, providing opportunities to empower and support girls and women and creating protective environments is where a lot of our focus is right now, um, especially if you are getting funds through rape prevention education, this focus on these outer level community and society level work. Um, that's where our focus is right now. We're seeking to really strengthen protective factors. We're seeking to build safe and healthy communities, including the communities in our work, the workplace communities that, that we're in, and establish and consistently apply effective policies. So what Dr. Basile mentioned when, when she was talking about prevention implications for this research is so important, and I think it ties perfectly into this technical package guidance. Proactive approaches are, we know that they're very important when it comes to preventing workplace sexual violence, and we also know that the top-down approaches are best. This means that leaders, managers within workplace environments are on board and invested in change, not I just want to point out not to check off a list to say we did this and we can move on um, or we did what's legally um, required of us and we can move on, but really they're invested in creating safe, healthy, and, and productive workplace environments. And I know there were several folks having this conversation in the text chat, which I thought was really interesting because they were saying, um, basically, I was like, maybe they could just present because it's exactly, there we're talking about exactly what I'm talking about now, that top-down approach and why it's so important. So we receive, at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, we receive many types of requests. Um, we've, we have, we still, we are receiving requests um, regularly about workplace sexual violence prevention. Some of the themes include um, requests around research. Folks are contacting us and saying, what does the research say? What works best? I cannot tell you how happy I am when someone reaches out to me and they want to know what the research says. Um, I think that says a lot about where, what, how people are thinking about um, violence prevention in general. People want to know what does the research say, what works, what works best. Um, and so we get a lot of requests around research, and we have the world's largest library of resources here at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center on the topic of sexual violence. So if you are looking for something, we're a great place to start, especially research. And we um, are there, they also are asking, are there programs you can recommend to use with employees? So what does the programming curricula look like um, for work, for using with employees directly? And then we also um, are being asked what can organizational leadership do to prevent sexual violence and create a culture of respect in the workplace? Again, not just what we have to do to not get sued. Um, which is really great to hear people thinking about culture change in their workplace environments. I did want to mention something that Dr. Basile was talking about as well. With the, we felt we've seen an increase in conversations 
people reaching out um, to us around this in this area since the spotlight on the Me Too and Time's Up movements. We saw a surge in requests from media at that time, and we are still seeing requests around this topic on a fairly regular basis. It's been a really great opportunity for us, especially uh, with our media requests, to have really great conversations about messaging and um, about um, putting responsibility where, where, where it belongs. And it's really an opportunity for us to talk about how these movements, Me Too and Time's Up, intersect with our sexual violence prevention work. And I really think, um, just on a personal level, it's given us this a different platform. Um, it's opened up new doors for us with different um, media outlets, uh, you know, people we didn't think we would work with before, we're working with now because um, the, those intersections are happening between, between and among the movements. Recently, we've been um, connecting with folks reaching out for, especially media um, requesters reaching out for information um, as they're reporting on the, on the Harvey Weinstein trial that's happening. Um, I... I have been talking to um, some folks as well. I'm really big into pop culture. I love TV. I love movies. I love streaming services. I love celebrities. I'm a little bit obsessed. And so I've been really obsessed with The Morning Show, which is the Apple um, TV's um, show that with Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon. And that whole um, first season that just aired is, is is focusing on workplace harassment and workplace abuse. And I know it's brought up a lot of questions um, just internally here um, from people I've, I work with in this movement as well as my own personal life. And so I feel like more people are talking about, does that really happen? I can't imagine that happening. Or, you know, it's, it's given people um, that I know in my life um, an area where they can, can say, oh, something like that happened to me, and I didn't even think about it as abuse. So I really think, like, the spotlight with these movements as well as the spotlight um, in entertainment has really um, increased our ability to um, exposure on the issue and also, like, our ability to help people find ways to make those connections to prevention. So we have an online resource collection you'll see here on the, on the um, PowerPoint, Ending Sexual Assault and Harassment in the Workplace. This uh, online collection that's on our website covers everything from what is sexual harassment to resources and tools for advocates and employers, also the impact of workplace sexual violence um, in specific industries, as Dr. Bastille mentioned, um, you know, there are specific industries and there's some um, need for research around how this looks in specific industries. And so we do have a few reports in this collection. Um, there's a report from the National Park Service, a report from the Chicago Women in Trades about harassment of women in traditionally male-dominated occupations, um, reports about harassment in the restaurant industry, and also there's a section on the impact of workplace sexual violence on immigrant workers, specifically looking at the farm worker industry and food industry. And then the page also offers information on the specific role and responsibility of employers. We've had a focus on workplace sexual violence prevention at NSCRC for many years. We even had a past Sexual Assault Awareness Month campaign that focused on workplace sexual, um, sexual harassment and abuse and how to prevent that. So we've been gathering and updating resources on this topic for over a decade now, but this um, page has been recently um, rehauled and, and um, uh, made shiny and spiffy and new within the past year. And then we also have this other section of our website um, that goes along with that where it's a resource page that provides um, some more resources specifically for employers, including sample workplace policies. I know some people were looking um, for that as well. I do want to highlight, and this has been talked about in the text chat, but I did want to highlight um, the wonderful work of the Workplaces Respond to Domestic and Sexual Violence. This is the National Resource Center um, that Futures has. I wanted to really highlight this because we do refer, to, refer people to it a lot. I love this um, this website because it provides resources, it provides training, it provides technical assistance um, to a number of different um, different people, employers, survivors, coworkers, advocates, 
And it's really looking at how do we prevent and respond to sexual harassment, abuse, assault, and other forms of violence that are impacting the workplace. Um, they have a lot of resources here. I always think this is a really good starting point, and we have these feature, this information feature on our web pages as well. They have a guide for advocates, which is really cool. It outlines some strategies that advocates can implement to help prevent and respond to workplace um, sexual harassment and abuse. They actually have someone asked about model workplace policies. I like their, theirs is um, really cool because it's customizable, um, and that's a policy on responding to violence in the workplace that that again, that employee, employers can customize that. And then they also have this really cool um, list of action items for employers to address sexual harassment. It's top, the top 10 things employers can do right now to address sexual harassment in the workplace. And so I highly recommend um, this as a starting point if you're looking for more information, training, technical assistance um, on preventing workplace domestic violence, sexual harassment, and stalking. And then NSCRC also released this resource in 2017. We wanted to capture the key findings um, that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, their select task force on the study of harassment in the workplace, they did a year-long look at sexual harassment in the workplace. And they, they developed this report. And so we took the report. We wanted to really look at how they're demonstrating um, what steps are necessary for employers to move toward prevention. And the key findings include a lot, um, our key findings document and what we found in the report itself, it really includes a lot of what was mentioned earlier in the overview of this new research. Um, workplace harassment is still a persistent problem. It often goes unreported because victims fear negative reactions. And I was thinking, you know, there's probably a lot, um, again, we can imply like or infer certain things through the research, but we do know that people are showing up to work because they're afraid. They're not saying anything because they're afraid. If people need to work. People need to work to pay bills. People need to work to get their health insurance, and there's a lot of fear around that. Um, it benefits workplaces to prevent and respond to sexual harassment since it's costly. I know this was also said earlier, but they did. Um, they looked at the amount in direct costs um, about, um, you know, how much it costs um, to uh, for settlement um, in um, sexual harassment, jury awards, the totals of that, and really looking at um, the cost, you know, thinking about the cost um, to workplaces. And then also um, one of the findings is that change starts at the top. So here we are again when we're thinking about prevention, employers should foster a culture where sexual harassment is not tolerated and that and where respect is promoted. Um, so again, it's not just saying um, we're going to do this one program, everybody has to sign a thing saying they're not going to harass each other and then we move on with our lives, but actually creating an environment um, and a culture of respect. And then organizations should have a stated comprehensive policy against harassment that outlines the different behaviors that will not be accepted and the procedure for reporting and responding as confidentially as possible um, when something happens. And then another finding um, was training must change by moving, again, just beyond compliance training to a holistic effort to prevent and respond to harassment. So um, we really appreciated the work that they did when they looked at this, kind of did this year-long look at sexual harassment in the workplace, and we, we really, did, in this document, wanted to pull out those key findings, and so you will find that there. Um, and I think that those are some of the resources that I wanted to highlight. So I appreciate the time to do that. Was there, I don't know if there were any questions, because I was looking... Uh, elsewhere besides the text chat as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Jen. Those, um, you know, really appreciate you walking us through all of those resources. And Tori was um, trying to keep up with you by putting all the links <laughs> in the text chat so folks could um, take a look at those um, at their, you know, when their time permits. I wanted to go back. I'm going to go back a couple of slides. Okay, so I wanted to go back to, um, and thank you so much for highlighting the Stop SV technical package um, and specifically pointing out the strategies around um, creating protective environments and providing opportunities to empower and support girls and women. Um, and I wanted to just um, say that, so, um, 
In terms of creating uh, protective environments and strengthening economic supports, um, there have been a couple of conversations that Prevent Connect has um, had in web conferences in the last couple of years um, that I just wanted to share because they really tie into um, you know, the conversations that we had with Kathleen around the data and then the implications for prevention specifically tied to the technical package. Um, and so, you know, there we did a web conference um, really looking at um, how workplaces and their organizational policies um, can support norms that um, make sexual and intimate partner violence a workplace issue. Um, so I'm going to post a link to that because I think there was some really interesting um, learning and resources shared in that web conference. Also in the same web conference, um, we looked at, um, I believe it was work out of Wyoming, um, trying to um, close the, uh, the wage gap in the state of Wyoming. They have a very um, large wage gap um, out of, out of the, all of the states in the country. So um, I wanted to share that because I think it ties um, really nicely into not only strengthening economic supports, but also creating those protective factors or protective environments for prevention. Um, and I actually see um, Shirley asking, what are actual prevention strategies and work that's being done that you can share and tell us about? And how, how can, you know, we build protective environments for prevention um, in terms of sexual harassment in the workplace? So, Jen, I'm not sure. I know you gave us a lot of um, some of the, the themes that you all have seen um, in terms of technical assistance. And I'm not sure if you have any um, examples outside of the ones that I just provided. Um, I'm going to head over and put the links to those. But I wanted to check in with you and see if you have any other examples from some of the work that's happening across the country. Yeah, that's a great question. I know that this is an area um, as far as sexual violence, that we we don't have a ton of specific examples. I know um, the ones that <laughs> actually gave were ones that I was thinking of immediately. Um, I think when we've been talking to people about this, um, as we're going out and doing trainings in communities, um, a lot of people are foc are really focusing um, right now on po the policy end of it. So working those who are working um, in working with different industries and workplaces in their communities are really focusing on that top-down approach and, and starting with the, with the like, um, rehauling of the policies, um, getting people really good information about that whole, like, how, to, and really it's, it's like training the managers, training the leadership, um, how do we change the culture in this environment, in this organization, in this industry, in this workplace? And so I know that a lot of work is happening there um, as a start. I w I, we just started the, um, our new sort of five, we just started we're year one of our new five-year funding from the CDC. And I know one of the things that we're looking forward to over the next five years is we're being tasked with capturing some of those um, lessons learned and success stories um, a, among various areas around sexual violence prevention. And so um, we're really looking forward to hopefully having a lot more examples in the coming years. So um, I don't know if I can say any more. I'm trying to think of like really specific examples, but I know policy is where a lot of people are, um, those who are actually focusing on. And I love the fact that a lot of people, um, there are, there are people who uh, are working with the Rape Prevention Education Grant, um, if they're funded through that. This Stop SV package, it's, our, it's basically our Bible here. It's like our, this is how we do our work. This is, this is the guide for that. And we really do a lot of training around this. And when we go out to communities, they're using this and saying, oh, good, I have something that legitimizes the work that I've been trying to do, right? So I've been trying to get into workplaces. I've been trying to change environments. I've been trying to, um, you know, talk to people about creating these protective environments, protective factors, all these things. So people are really, I think, looking at um, these examples and um, really moving, you know, being able to move their work forward with the support of um of the information that's being shared through this document and through the trainings that we're doing around that. Great. 
Thank you. Um, and so I also posted, um, so I posted a couple links um, that may be of interest to folks. Um, and, and one that I also just posted was on creating protective environments, specifically in like the restaurant and alcohol serving um, the, what am I trying to say, the <laughs> alcohol serving establishments. And um, so part of that um, conversation and some of the examples in that web conference really also focused on not just creating a protective environment for um, like patrons of an establishment, but also how do you protect your staff, right? And so that goes into this conversation of um, workplace-related sexual violence. And so what, do, what could those policies look like? How do you you know, not just create a protective environment for people um, who are coming into an establishment, but also for the people that you're employing and working in that establishment. Um, and then there's, uh, so I just wanted to point out that Kiana um, posted a link to um, some long-term workplace training that um, the, an organization called Hollaback is engaged in. Um, and then Leslie um, posted a link to a domestic violence education program for employers. Um, and so there's some more resources in the text chat of, um, you know, different strategies or approaches that people are taking. Um, I wanted to uh, move into another text chat question for everyone. Um, and that, oh, I have to, I forgot that I went back in slides, so give me one moment. Um, and so I'm wondering, so based on the conversation that we've been having, you know, we heard about some of the research um, that Kathleen shared. We heard about resources and some of, like, the themes that the National Sexual Violence Resource Center is seeing. And so I'm wondering, how, how will you strengthen um, your work to prevent workplace-related sexual violence? Um, maybe based on some of these conversations or, um, you know, just plans that you already had. So we'd love to, to hear from you all. Um, and, you know, everyone's been so great about sharing resources and the things that they're doing. So really appreciate that and looking forward to, to hear your answer to this question. Um, I wanted to check in with my colleague, Tori, and see, Tori, were there um, things that were coming up in the text chat that I may have missed or um, any questions for Kathleen and Jen? Uh, thanks, Ashley. I feel like we um, have brought forward all of the questions. There's just been so much resource sharing. So um, thank you, Kiana, to... Um, Kiana and um, Leslie for sharing your, your recent resources. I know that folks had expressed some interest in, um, in Kiana had mentioned some of the microaggression um, training that is happening. Um, and so Kiana's colleagues actually presented on some of that information at the 2019 Prevent Connect Prevention Town Hall. Um, so I posted that link in the text chat, and I can actually do that again as you all are um, chatting away about what you'll be doing to strengthen your work to prevent workplace-related sexual violence. And there were actually some folks who were doing some other really interesting workplace-related stuff um, that presented on the Prevent Connect Town Hall as well. So I would definitely encourage folks to check out the recording for that if you have a spare 90 minutes to... Um, hang out and chat, but Ashley, I'm wondering as we're waiting for folks to reply, um, if we want to talk about some extra resources and then report back later. Yeah, so um, so these are some newer things that have just kind of popped up in our um, knowledge base, <laughs> um, and so. And Jen, I know that um, this is something that we had actually talked about, um, this Everyday Activist Guide um, for Ending Workplace Sexual Harassment and Assault from Futures Without Violence. Um, and what I can say is that I think um, this guide has some really, really great stories and examples of uh, like worker-organized um, strategies to prevent uh, workplace sexual harassment and assault, and I think that there are quite a few of the activists that are portrayed that um, were guests on the web conferences that I posted about. Um, so, Jen, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about this Everyday Activist Guide. 
Uh, no, I didn't really have anything to add to it, just that it's, it's new and it was just great timing because as we were putting this um, together and putting our slides together, this came through my email and I was like, Ashley, look at this. This is great timing. Um, and I think, like, like Ashley said, it is more like, what can you do to, um, yeah, what, what's your role in, in helping to prevent um, sexual harassment and assault in your workplace? And I think it's just a nice, um, give some really good resources and tips and ideas for folks. So, um, yeah, I don't have anything to add except that this was good timing. So, yay, thanks, Futures. We, we love the work that Futures is doing, and we consider them to be a great partner in our work to prevent sexual violence. Great. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and then I also wanted to just mention, so um, many of you are probably familiar with Reliance, and Reliance has just launched Reliance Business. Um, and um, it's really exciting. We'll put a link to where you can read more about it, but um, Reliance Business will really be working with um, corporations and organizations who, um, you know, really want to commit to changing the culture of their workplaces and um, creating protective environments. And so these are just some of the um, – things that Reliance Business will be offering to business, doing assessment, collecting data and research, um, you know, looking at policies that can be um, implemented. And so you can read all about that on their website, uh, but I wanted to just bring that to everyone's attention as well because that's very exciting news. Um, so we still have a couple of minutes left, and so I just want to put a call out to see um, if there were any questions um, for either Jen Grove from NSCRC or for Kathleen Bastille at CDC about some of the research. Um, so this is your chance <laughs> to add to that text chat if there were any questions um, that you wanted to ask before we end for today. Um, Kathleen, I wanted to just bring you back, and Jen, um, and thank you both so much for um, being willing to come on this web conference and um, share your work and um, just wondering, you know, if you've been looking at the text chat or hearing what people are doing, um, if you have any reflections on um, some of the, the work that's happening and questions that people are asking before we go today. Yeah, so thanks. This is Kathleen. I, I'm just so thrilled to see all the resources that are available on this topic, um, to hear about all the prevention work that's being done. Um, when we did the technical package, it was only a few years ago. Uh, it came out in 2015. But like Jen was saying, the evidence for specifically for workplace-related sexual violence is in the policy, the workplace policies. But it's so exciting to see and hear about other prevention work that's kind of expanding the idea of creating protective environments. So that's really wonderful to see. So I just want to say thank you um, for the opportunity to share the new research that we have on the topic and to be part of this uh, webinar. It's been great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is Ben. I just – oh, sorry. Do you want me to nope. chime in? Please go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So this is Jen. I just wanted to um, – yeah, similarly, like I'm, I'm actually clicking – I probably shouldn't be doing this. Um, I'm copying and pasting and clicking on things that people have been, like, the entire time this webinar has been happening. I've been over here on my Internet Explorer just looking at all, all kinds of resources that you all are sharing. So I really appreciate that because as a resource center, we want to know what's out there. Um, and so do you have my email or maybe I could – can I put that in the text? I don't know. I just want folks to, like, know they can – if they've got a resource they think is great and they want us to include in our collection, I just want to put it out there that we would be more than willing to um, take a look at that and use it and talk about it in our trainings. Um, so I'm really um, grateful for folks who have been sharing all the great resources that they know about as well as um, research studies. And um, I know we, we talked about already the um, – non-binary and gender diverse community and and resources specifically for them. And that's something we're always trying to pay attention to as well and find out more about like what is all out there, where are the gaps, how can those gaps be filled, who can fill them. And so um, any information that folks want to share with us um, or with me specifically, I would love to to connect with people. 
great, thank you. And um, so just a couple uh, other things that are coming up in the tech chat. Kiana said for future research, um, it would be interesting to know, um, you know, are people, how many people have left a job because of the assault or harassment? And Jen, I think you mentioned this earlier that, you know, if you think about workplace harassment and, and sexual violence, that's really difficult because one thing that um, the majority of us need to do is, you know, pay our bills. And um, usually the way we do that is through our job. Um, so that is one point that was made. And then Leah asked, um, looking for, you know, are people aware of strategies for when it's the people at the top who are, you know, engaging in the, um, the violent behavior or are doing the harassing, you know, how do you, how do we deal with that? Um, and so there's some conversation going on around that. Um, I do think that that Everyday Activist Guide from Futures has some great stories, like I said, about um, like workers organizing around um, sexual harassment and sexual assault, so that might be a good place. Um, and uh, Kiana also said, future research that further breaks down um, identity components. Um, and so, yes. Um, there are definitely gaps with that. Um, so I don't see any other questions um, coming through, but I, I do really just want to appreciate you all for joining us today and for being so engaged um, in, in the conversation and sharing resources. Um, you know, I feel like I say this a lot, but this is not the only conversation around this topic, clearly. Um, there's, you know, so much more to learn and, um, you know, for us to explore. So um, with that, let's see, we will be sending out um, an email in the next week or so when the recording of this session is available. So um, you all will automatically get that email letting you know. Um, at this point, you, you can um, download the slides if you wanted to um, see those again and you hadn't already downloaded them. We will be sending out a brief evaluation survey um, following this web conference, and we really do value your, your feedback. Um, there's also a certificate of completion that's available to you at the um, a certificate of attendance that's available to you at the completion of the survey. Um, so there's that. Um, and then of course, if you have any questions or you know want to continue the conversation, we would love to hear from you. Um, and you're welcome to contact us. Oh, and um, hi, Esther May. Um, Esther Ney is actually with Reliance Business, and so it's really exciting to have had you in this web conference. Um, but I think at this point, I am going to um, wish you all a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and um, let you know that I look forward, we look forward to seeing you on a future web conference. And this is going to um, end our web conference for today. So take care, everyone.